This, the WYCC Spring Mystery Marathon. I'm Cindy Seiperic. I'm the Director of Programming here at WYCC, and I am thrilled to be joined by Chicago mystery author Libby Fisher. Hellman, welcome, Libby. So very glad uh, that you're here. Um, you've been writing novels now for, what did you say, about 15 about years? Since 15 2002 years. or so? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Libby is going to be here talking with us. Uh, and uh, I guess where I'd like to start is, how did you become a mystery writer? What was that journey for you? Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> this, uh, mystery writing is my fourth reinvention. Prior to that, I worked at NPR. I worked in TV news at a PBS station um, and also network television. Um, but I was on my own after the PR business. I was, I was doing the same things I did there on my own. I had two little kids at home. And so I was pretty much home during the day. I was freelancing. And the O.J. Simpson trial was on TV. And I don't know if you watched it back then, but I was glued to the TV. And I knew that something wasn't going well for the prosecution, but I didn't know enough about legal uh, procedure to know what it was. My ex-husband was a lawyer, and I used to call him up and say, you're not going to believe this, but this happened and this happened. He'd say, yeah, okay, fine, wonderful. I'll talk to you when, when I get home. Anyway, um, after he was acquitted, um, my dad passed away. And we went to Washington for the funeral, which is where I grew up in Washington, D.C. And when we came back, I went down into my basement and I emerged four months later with the most awful mystery that's ever been written. It should never have seen the light of day and it never will. Oh, but, I but I <laughs> had the bug. But I never related it to the O.J. Simpson trial. I never related it and for years people would say, well why'd you start writing mysteries? And I would say, well, you know, I can tell you when and I can tell you how but I never quite knew why and then about five years ago or maybe six or seven years ago when he was arrested in Vegas for trying to sell his that. own memorabilia I'm looking at this and I'm saying oh my gosh I now know why I'm writing it's because of his trial it opened up an entirely new world to me that I didn't know existed the world of forensics I mean, wow. it, it was it was a dream. It you know it was a dream scene. You had the bloody glove. You had the shoe prints. You had the blood spatter. You had Ron Goldman's glasses. You had fingerprints. You had his DNA. And I never knew that police could do that much analysis from those kinds of things. And I obviously internalized it. And after my dad died, decided that I should write about it. Well, I think it's awesome, and I'm so <laughs> thrilled that you're here sharing this with us. It's very interesting to hear that kind of insight as to what, what inspires somebody. I'm Cindy Seiferic. Don't let me forget to tell you that. I'm the Director of Programming here, and I am joined uh, with a special treat for you, Libby Fisher-Hellman. She's the author of many uh, books. Your latest is Havana Lost, uh, yes. and I'm so pleased that you're here. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier, and I'm... I'm so excited to talk a little bit more with you about those books. Um, and I'm curious about, because you have standalone books and you have series books, mm -hmm. how does that evolve? How do you, well, for me, it was a very personal decision. I started with a series. Well, I didn't know it was going to be a series when I wrote the, um, the first book that was published was not the first book I wrote. It was the fourth book I wrote. And I needed to learn the craft of writing fiction. And finally, I got it, and so they um, published it. It was an Ellie Foreman book. Ellie is, of all things, a video producer and a single mother in the Chicago area. She's got a teenage daughter and a senior citizen father, and so she's part of the sandwich generation. I wrote four books in that series, and then I started to get a little restless. Um, I love Amateur Sleuth, which Ellie is, but it's kind of difficult to find a logical, credible reason for an amateur sleuth to be involved in a murder investigation. I mean, a video producer just doesn't come up against dead bodies every day. So I had introduced another female, Georgia Davis, who was a police officer during the Ellie books. She conveniently got herself suspended from the police force and hung out a shingle as a PI. 
So I wrote three books about her with, uh, being a PI. Then I started to get a little restless again. I was a history major in college, and I love history, and I love going back to see why we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And I started, so I wrote what ultimately became what we're calling my Revolution Trilogy. Three books that each focus on a period of time, recent history, nothing, more, uh, nothing going back further than uh, the Cuban Revolution in the late 50s. Um, because I think there are periods of extreme conflict. And I think the, you can learn a lot about the way people treat each other, the way societies evolve, when you mix periods of extreme conflict with murder so interesting i've always wondered how you know how that works how you end up you know with with these well i was lucky because i was allowed i had different publishers for different for different books i have one Got publisher it. for my ellie series another one for the georgia davis series and yet another one for the standalones and we're so thankful for <laughs> all of it and we appreciate that you are generously donating uh several books uh that we're going to offer up in a raffle for any viewer who transitioned to to becoming a member in the 150 or the 250 dollar level uh we've got lots of great mystery related thank you gifts now i'm going to put you on the spot here libby i know you know you do have a, a background in pbs albeit news um i'm curious if you have a favorite detective or a favorite author that's that's featured you know, hmm. either on Tuesday nights on WYCC or as part of this mystery marathon? Well, I can tell you, yes, I do. I like Hercule Poirot. I do. And I love Agatha Christie. Um, and I love the series of Midsummer Murders. Midsummer Murders, yes, uh -huh, with Inspector just, Barnaby and Troy. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, I love them. They're just, they're so cleverly done. And, you know, you're, you're in a village. You're not in a big city like Chicago. Um, and yet, there's evil that lurks in small villages, too. So it's, it's very well done. I like that. And, of course, I love Agatha Christie. She's just, you know, she's incomparable. I, I have an Agatha Christie story for you. Oh, you I'd want. love to hear it. Well, I was at a conference where I was researching. I was supposed to actually play a role of Agatha Christie, something I did not know. In 1926, her first marriage fell apart. Um, her husband started seeing another woman. She disappeared for 11 days, Agatha Christie. She just went off the grid, and no one knew where she was. No one knew what was going on with her. 11 days later, they found her at a small hotel in the countryside. And to this day, no one quite knows why she did it. Some people thought she was having a nervous breakdown. Nervous breakdown, that would be my guess. Other people thought she was trying to disappear so it would look like her husband had committed some kind of foul play and still other people say she just wanted to embarrass him because she registered under his girlfriend's name oh good for her oh, i just love there agatha christie thank you for sharing <laughs> that i tell you for all the research that i've done on, on agatha christie because that was my introduction to mystery and i i just I love her. She, she always have a soft uh, place in my heart. Uh, so it's interesting to hear something that I didn't know, and I'm sure our viewers uh, feel the same way. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. And uh, while you're making your call of support to WYCC, I'm going to talk a little bit more with uh, Libby. So interesting. A moment ago, you were saying that you've done so many things prior to becoming a writer. Uh, and one of the things that you had mentioned that you were in network television and you were at PBS. I started out at PBS in Washington. Um, and then I was at network television as well, so. So I'm curious, having, now I, I only have public television experience. I have not been in the commercial world. So I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are in this media landscape and the, the, you know. The I've always had a soft spot in my heart for public television. There is an absolute, it is absolutely critical to keep public television going. Network television is all corporately owned now and while the news people do tell you what you need to know. They're not as robust. You don't get every side of the issue as completely and as substantively as you do with PBS. And I need that. I'm a former news junkie. Well, I call myself a recovering news junkie. But I need all those opinions and I need to go beneath the surface. And that's what PBS always does.
Well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I know that that's something that I feel, um, and it certainly uh, is a thrill to know that, that uh, you feel the same way. Um, thank you so much for taking this time no. to talk with us, and I'm looking Pleasure. forward to talking more with you uh, about uh, everything that you've done for mystery and mystery writing. Uh, and thank you again for the book. Thank you, Greg. I am here with Libby Fisher-Hellman, and I, I hardly know where to start. I have so many questions for you, and I know, I hope you're going to stick around long after the Mystery Marathon, because I have so much I want to find out from you. But, you know, you, you have a, a, an advanced degree in filmmaking, if I understand correctly. Yes. I'm curious what, what role that might play in how you write your books. You know, th that's a great question, and it's an important role, because for me, um, I went to film school to learn how to translate the literal into the visual. And now I've made a complete circle and come back to the literal, but I have the visual component with me. I can't write a scene unless I can see it like a film. I mean, complete with long shots and establishing shots and dolly shots and then, you know, editing back and forth, close-ups. I have to see it. And if I can't see it, I can't write it. That's, that's super interesting because as, as we watch mysteries and we've had this conversation in past mystery marathons you know do you like the book better do you like the the film better um it, it, it's it's a little bit like comparing apples and oranges isn't it yeah because it is. it's a very different thing and so a i really, different experience i can really appreciate yeah. that in it what great insight yeah. um i'm curious um what would you say is more important um the first lines of a story or a cliffhanger oh that's a really good question we spend months crafting that first line um, it's got to be perfect it's got to be perfect in that it says something about the tone of the book it says something about where the story is picking up because you always want to start in the middle of things um, and it has to be beautifully the prose has to be beautiful prose so a lot of times the first sentence doesn't happen until i finish the book that's other times wow. I have the first sentence in my head and that gets me going because I have the first sentence. I have the first sentence for my next book, which is going to be an Ellie book, by the way. Um, I haven't written her in about six or seven years, so I'm, I'm kind of anxious to get it's back about to time. her. It's about time. My old friend Ellie, I'll be, I'll be coming back to her, but I have the first sentence of that already in my book, uh, in my head. Um, cliffhangers are important, too because that makes the reader stay up a little bit later than they want to. A just bit later. I can't put the book down. Why <laughs> do you do that to me? I, listen, I, I, I'm the same way. I mean, I love a well-crafted book that has some cliffhangers. Well, Not every I'm chapter. in good company, aren't I? <laughs> well, I uh, so much appreciate uh, all that you're offering to me. Really, oh. this is just all about me. No, it's, it's for all of our <laughs> viewers. They're enjoying you just as much. And I want to thank you again for these great books that you have uh, graciously offered to us for part of the raffle. Um, dare I ask this question? We talked just a little bit about it. You know, you talked about the Ellie Foreman book, and we're definitely looking forward to that next uh, installment. Um, but you also have uh, another PI, Georgia? Georgia Davis. Georgia Davis. Do you have a favorite? Is, is that how? They are so different. Ellie, Ellie wants to go out to lunch. She will give you TMI, too much information about her life. Georgia will not go out to lunch with you. She's cautious. She's reserved. She doesn't want to get involved with people. So they're very different people, and I think they're both sort of different sides of my split personality. Oh, but, that's... but I would deny that. Well, I'm sorry. That was a tough question. And I apologize <laughs> for putting you on the spot like that, but I was curious. And, and I think, you know, off camera we were, we were talking, and you right. said it's kind of like asking um, which child of yours yes. is a favorite. And I exactly. often wondered if that's how authors felt about their creation. So thank you again so much for being Yes. Sometimes she even wears trousers. Can you imagine that? I'm Cindy Seiferic. I'm the director of programming here at WYCC. I am joined by Libby Fisher-Hellman, uh, who is a Chicago area author who writes strong female characters. There's yes, a lot I to do. talk about just about that. So what well, do you think about Miss Fisher? Well, I love Franny. She is, you know, she's, as you said, way ahead of her time. She's sophisticated. She's a modern woman. She's, but, and yet she's the kind of character we can all relate to and we want you know we we root for her we want to see her forge new territory and do all of the things she's doing and solve the murder at the same time 
and it helps that she's so beautiful and oh, she has such well, a lovely yeah. clothing and beautiful yeah. jewelry and and it's interesting because her character is um she she had humble roots and then all of a sudden she's got all this money so that that yeah, adds a fun it's little terrific yeah by the way her um the, uh, the series is written by Carrie Greenwood, and she is published in the United States by the same publisher that publishes my L.A. Foreman series, Poison Pen Press. So doesn't that speak to some great taste with Poison <laughs> Pen Press? I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you are a you are an author. You s specialize in lots of different kinds of, of of genres. You said history and all of that. But one of the things with Ellie Foreman and with Georgia Davis is and a in my standalones, strong they're strong female characters. Female characters. Um, I really like to place women in situations where their choices have been taken away from them, where they're kind of up against the wall, and see how they react. Some women will become heroes or heroines. Other women may become cowards and I always love to see what's going to happen because I don't always write about heroines in my standalones there's a couple of women who, who let's say are less than perfect but I really enjoy that and I really think it's important when you take a look at it women make up 80 percent of the book buying public and there should be at least 50 or 60 percent of books that are geared toward them. That's absolutely right. You know, strong women support mystery. They support PBS. Greg, Greg, uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by Chicago mystery writer Libby Fisher Hellman. And, you know, you're a great writer. I think it's extra cool that you're from Chicago. Um, and Chicago is, is part of the books, too. It's not just strong female characters, but it's, it's Chicago, Every too. Every book is either set completely in Chicago or has a big chunk of it set in Chicago. I moved to Chicago for the weather. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. Seriously, no, it's, it's not serious, especially after the winter we've had. But um, Chicago is the quintessential city. There are pockets of light, and then there are pockets of dark. There are places you would never go, I would never go at night. And those are the places that fascinate me. What goes on there? Who, who, what's happening there? What are the shadows trying to tell us? And it's not only that, the politics of Chicago is just such a wonderful spectator sport. Um, the sports teams themselves, um, the beautiful lakefront compared with some areas in Chicago that aren't so beautiful. The contrast between light and dark, beautiful and ugly, fair and unfair are, are just paradise for a mystery writer. Mm. Just to see Chicago, our beautiful city of Chicago, through your eyes is is fascinating. But you know, one of the things that I've, I've talked about earlier in this mystery marathon is that viewer support enables us not only to bring great mystery programs and to bring authors like you into our studios right. to talk with and kind of pick your brain, but it also gives us an opportunity to uh, produce local programs that highlight everything that Chicago has to offer, including the Chicago Blues. Now, ah. we have a series coming up that is right. shot at uh, Buddy Guy's Legends, and you... Well, I have the perfect companion for that series, and that happens to be an anthology that I edited. It includes stories by 21 mystery authors in Chicago, some of them much more well-known than me, and it, it's called Chicago Blues. And all of the stories revolve around blues as the author wanted to interpret them. So there are stories about Chicago blues musicians. There are a few stories about the Blue Line L. There's, there's a couple of stories about blues, depression, and, and they get into lower whacker to really make us all depressed. Um, <laughs> and it came out about four or five years ago, but it's still selling really, really well. And um, I would suggest and offer and would be Encourage delighted sure. that your viewers read it. Take a look at it, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Libby, not only for the books that you generously donated to our viewers when they pledged their support, but thank you for being here and sharing oh. so much of who you are uh, and all that you have to offer the mystery fans here in Chicago. I wanted to take just a minute to read something um, that you wrote. Uh, you mentioned that you are originally from D.C., but Chicago is now your home, and you said, over the years, I would meet transplants from Chicago who invariably told me how much I'd love it here. 
in Chicago, that I was the kind of person who would appreciate and thrive in the city. I didn't take them seriously, but it turned out they were right. I know without a doubt that had I not moved here, I would never have become a writer. I'm so glad you moved here. I'm so glad you're a writer. I'm so glad that you came here and spent some time with us. And I thank you for joining us for this Spring Mystery Marathon. I think it was one of the best ones we've ever had. Uh, hope to hear from you if we haven't already. 888-993-9922. We'll see you next time.